militancy and martyrdom. Does the paradigm have a future? One of the key features of the guerrilla insurgency in Punjab, in structural terms, was its diffuse and decentralized quality. Although there was an early attempt to organize the entire community under the leadership of a council of five, the Panthic Committee, factionalization was rife from the beginning, and several different Panthic committees at various times have claimed to speak for the Khalistani Sikh Panth. There have been at least five major guerrilla forces, which split up, joined back together, and split up again regularly. Even at snapshot moments in time when a logical command structure could be pointed out, small groups of individuals had considerable autonomy in deciding on and carrying out missions. This lack of disciplined organization, is alternately praised as indicative of the essentially democratic nature of the Panth, or condemned as militarily inefficient. What is clear is that the passionate quality of Sikh martyrdom, as described above, is often at odds with military strategy in the strict sense to the word. The incongruity between effective militancy philosophy, and rhetoric martyrdom, is increasingly brought to the fore in Khalistani Sikh movement, facing the undeniability to the ebbing of insurgent power in Punjab, are taking a particularly urgent tone. The atomistic quality of Sikh militancy over the past 10 to 15 years, was probably responsible for the attraction it provided to young men in particular, for whom the heady experience of holding a gun, was coupled with almost unbounded freedom to decide what to do with it. It is also clear that, religious ideals aside, substantial atrocities were committed by these undisciplined groups of youths, some of whom took advantage of the militancy to carry out personal vendettas or to commit crimes, and others who probably simply didn't understand what the insurgency was actually all about. There were, for example, many communal killings, directed against the Hindu population of Punjab, although Khalistani leaders have always been firm on the point, that they are not against Hindus per se, but against the government of India and its representatives. Bombs went off in crowded Hindu neighborhoods, women and children were massacred on buses. The predominantly young men involved in these actions, were rarely disciplined by higher-ups in the militant organizations, and if reprimanded, they could always turn to one of the other guerrilla units. The major human rights organizations have all criticized the abuses carried out by militant groups, at the same time as they criticized the violations carried out by the state. Though the Khalistani militancy never lacked for recruits, it did admit practically anyone who wanted to fight. In this lack of discrimination, it risked what in fact happened, the crumbling of the movement from within, as well as its repression from without. Many villagers eventually became disillusioned with the militants, as well as tired of suffering at the hands of police. Where do the heroic aspects of martyrdom, as described above, fit into this less than romantic picture of the Khalistani insurgency? It would be a mistake, I believe, to discount the former because of the depredations of the latter, as tends to happen in most accounts of Sikh militancy. The tendency to view the philosophy of martyrdom as a sort of secondary or after-the-fact justification for violence, is particularly unhelpful, its skeptical attitude towards Sikh religious commitment being more a function of secular Western ethnocentrism, than a facet of Khalistani reality. Though the infiltration of the Khalistani guerrilla forces by people totally uninterested in faith is undoubted, the backbone of the movement remained, and remains today, a core of spiritually dedicated individuals. Rather than using the gap between the ideal of martyrdom, and the reality of less than perfect guerrilla fighters to point to the lack of applicability of ideals, I see the Sikh conceptualization of martyrdom, as itself leaving the door open to the kind of military free-for-all, that has characterized phases of the Khalistan movement. People who see themselves as primarily attuned to guru, as described above, clearly do best in situations in which individual motivation is called for, and less well in situations in which that primary connection has to be constrained by organizational priorities. This gives the movement a certain resiliency, but also leaves it open to abuses. Furthermore, the passionate commitment of individual fighters to Khalistan, to Sikhism, and to each other, is the foundation of, but can also seriously hamper, strategic military and political efforts.
The lack of centralization in the Khalistan movement has a strong historical foundation, however, and leaders are hesitant to tamper with it. When Guru Gobind Singh, the tenth and last guru, asked for volunteers who would be willing to give their heads for the faith, five men stood up, forming the basis for the initial Khalsa siblinghood. After their initiation by Amrit, Gobind Singh asked the five, henceforward called five beloved ones, to in turn initiate him into the Khalsa order. This gesture radically decentered the Sikh community, vesting the power even to initiate a guru with five ordinary people. Any five Sikhs who come together can in fact still be called five beloved ones, and can make decisions as representatives of the Panth. The spirit of the entire community is thus condensed primarily in face-to-face -face groups, which both encourages personal involvement, and disperses authority dramatically. When this localization of decision-making is combined with a martyrological tradition emphasizing dying for truth and love, concepts which are open to a fair amount of individual interpretation, the result can be chaotic. Who is, or is not a true Sikh, is in fact highly contested in the militant milieu. It is the tenor of these arguments, sometimes quite surreal, that leads to the accusation of fundamentalism from those excluded from the true Sikh category, and from Western scholars who see resonances of Khomeini and Falwell, in the narrowness of the debates. The linkage of the political movement for a sovereign Khalistan with the broader notion of serving and protecting the faith, clearly leads to a certain volatility in the guerrilla movement. The owner of a chain of newspapers which published anti-Sikh tracts was assassinated, did this action effectively serve the cause, or was it simply an emotional response by an individual offended by perceived blasphemy? The same ambiguity surrounds many other acts of violence committed by militants over the past 10 to 15 years of insurgency. The sincerity of the response, and the courage exhibited in carrying them out were applauded, but it was often less clear what the practical results were. While most militant Sikhs defend the varied actions of Khalistani militants as all part and parcel of the general struggle, as indicative of the flexibility and breadth of the movement, there is an increasingly vocal group calling for a more tightly disciplined approach. Particularly in the current climate, in which at least surface quiet in Punjab makes talk of mass uprising seem rhetorical at best, a strategy of investing a smaller group of militants with the symbolic power of the whole population, seems a likely response, and one which is shared with similar movements in other parts of the world. The smaller spearhead group would then focus on international pressure, and on key persuasive events, rather than encouraging the kind of deeply personal responses and encounters, that have thus far flourished. If events do develop in this direction, it will be interesting to see how the traditional conception of the saint soldier, always ready to fight and die for his faith, evolves. One Sikh leader, after a particularly motivational speech, had several young people rush up afterwards, saying they wanted to die. He had to use all his powers of persuasion, to convince them that they could best be of service in some other capacity than as martyrs. In this context, the classic paradigm of an organized, strategic group affecting events through carefully planned actions, what could be called the professional model, is at odds with the Sikh tradition of militancy, a populist one based on the idea of the citizen as saint, citizen as soldier. When you celebrate a tradition in which the true Sikh is the Sikh who fights, how do you justify restricting fighting to a narrower group than the entire population? Given the continuing unwillingness of the Indian government to come clean on what actually happened during Operation Blue Star, on its complicity in the anti-Sikh pogroms following the Gandhi assassination, and on the human rights abuses going on in Punjab still, the bold figure of the Amrit Hari Sikh who will go to his death but will not be silenced, remains an important symbol for people whose concerns and humanity, seem to have been dismissed by the state of which they form a part. That these militants have also committed acts of terror and violence, seems to their supporters less atrocious, not only because of the cause on whose behalf the acts were carried out, but also because of the forthrightness with which the militants accept the necessity for such violence, as part of the war they are fighting. What for one side is war, for the other side is crime, and it is this discrepancy that provokes amplifying messages of revolutionary violence on one side, and draconian punishment on the other. 
Whatever concessions are made to professional strategy on the part of Kalistani militants, the figure of the passionate martyr as the ultimate symbol of legitimate Sikh struggle, is sure to persist. It is, I suggest, enhanced by each government attempt to minimize Sikh suffering, to criminalize Sikh heroes, and to sweep the last decade or two under the rug as if nothing had happened. Scholars in arenas of violent conflict obviously face many methodological and ethical challenges. The philosophical challenge of coming to grips with an existential stance radically different from one's own, is less easily talked about. Anthropologists, I suggest, with their orientation to cultural difference, and to suspending judgment while investigating other realities, are in a particularly good position to try to understand what motivates individuals, to put their lives on the line for a cause, whatever that cause may be. Refraining from false exoticization of such people, while recognizing the very different perspectives on life and death they hold, is the task facing us, as we attempt to build a bridge between the other, the martyr, and ourselves. And crossing back and forth on that bridge as we engage in our job of translating across cultural divides without abandoning our own values, without condoning assassins and bombers, is a hefty challenge indeed. Martyrdom is often a tactic of the weak, who have to expect many deaths in confrontation with the powerful, and therefore find a way to make these meaningful. That seeks, as a small minority in a small corner of a large and overpopulated subcontinent, have developed a philosophically sophisticated tradition of martyrdom, is therefore not surprising. The celebration of martyrdom on the part of the weak is also, of course, greatly feared by the strong, who have always to worry that by winning battles they are creating more martyrs, and hence feeding the flames they seek to extinguish. Certainly the ethnographic study of the Sikh militant community, with full attention to the central role played by martyrdom in Sikh theology, makes clear that the way that the government of India has handled the Punjab crisis, was a Pyrrhic victory in this sense. It has crushed the Sikh militant movement by force, but there is little doubt that the seeds sown in this effort will sooner or later bear fruit, in one form or another. To expect otherwise is, I believe, to fail to learn from history, and to fail to take seriously the passions that animate seeks. The Panth or condemned as militarily inefficient. What is clear is that the passionate quality of Sikh martyrdom, as described above, is often at odds with military strategy in the strict sense to the word. The incongruity various times have claimed to speak for the Khalistani Sikh panth. There have been at least five major guerrilla forces, which split up, joined back together, and split up again regularly. Even at snapshot moments in time when a logical command structure could be pointed out, small groups of individuals had considerable autonomy in deciding on and carrying out missions. This lack of disciplined organization, is alternately praised as indicative of the essentially democratic nature of diffuse and decentralized quality. Although there was an early attempt to organize the entire community under the leadership of a council of five, the Panthic Committee, Factionalization was rife from the beginning, and several different Panthic committees at various Militancy and martyrdom. Does the paradigm have a future? One of the key features of the guerrilla insurgency in Punjab, in structural terms, was its 